but I'm going to turn the floor over to, to Tom Shand, uh, who's leading this. And uh, you can now, the floor is now yours on what can go wrong in procurement. Tom? Right. Thanks so much, Kevin. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got a uh, rather stellar panel of, of folks. Uh, welcome to Ed, John, Jeff, and Mike. Uh, rough calculation based on trying to look at some of the individual's experiences here. We've probably got well in excess of a 125 years of experience of writing fire truck specs, assisting customers, managing fleets. In Jeff's case, trying to figure out what's going on with them when they break. And in the case of more than a couple of you, a lot of hands-on experience of actually driving, operating, and riding the vehicles that we've spec. So uh, we have four topics we'd like to try to get through here in the next hour. Uh, last year was certainly kind of challenging with the, uh, the pandemic, both in the United States and up in John's neck of the woods in Canada, where uh, things that we traditionally did in person, uh, meetings across the table with our uh, sales personnel, in-person pre-construction conferences, uh, mid and final inspections, a lot of that stuff was uh, on the hay wagon and going in the other direction. So uh, first topic I'd like to cover is just you know, what's the fire department's customers' expectations? You know, working with them, whether in Jeff or Mike's case, working with them in a consulting capacity in John's position of trying to uh, get people through the uh, discernment process as to what they want to buy and get it on order. And in the case of Ed's, uh, gets an order and it comes in. And when the customer, uh, first time they try to meet Zoom-wise or in person, uh, find out that a lot of the things that were in the specs, the customer wasn't sure they were there, thought they were there, not sure why they were there. So uh, we'll kind of go around and uh, give everybody an opportunity to handle each of these. We'll try to spend about 10 minutes on each and uh, have some questions at the end. So John, from your perspective, many years of experience, uh, what, what issues have you found with folks lately of, uh, in, in that area? Well, first of all, thanks very much, everyone, and good day from the Great White North, where we can't travel yet. Uh, read the bitter specs. I find, and we find, too many people go, well, I thought. And sometimes manufacturers, dealers will say yes, when yes is vague. Read the specs. Too often, people don't read their specs. They need to read their specs of the bidders compared to their own specs, not just the yes or a no then they'll put in a caveat, maybe a, a clarification. So make sure you're sure of what you're getting before you go to a pre-construction and go, well, I thought I was getting. That's what we seem to have seen happen in the past. And uh, sometimes the Cadillac turns out to be a Chevy and you go, well, you asked for a Cadillac. How come you got a Chevy? Nobody wants to go back to purchase it and say, oh, whoops, I picked the wrong bidder. Thanks, John. Jeff, in, in your perspective, what kind of issues you find? You, you work in a very unique area uh, geographically in the fire truck market where people tend to buy some pretty high end uh, rigs. So what, what kind of experiences have you had in that area? Well, uh, first off, hello, everyone. And, and thank you for, for the invitation to participate in this. Um, I will echo what uh, John's comments about reading the specification because I find that, uh, and I just went through this with a department on, on a relatively minor item, but they thought they were getting auto lube system A to match what was in the rest of their fleet. And their specification gave them auto lube system B, which is different than what's in the rest of their fleet. Um, but my biggest thing I think in the last few years as far as customers' expectations is the unrealistic expectation on the part of the customer. Um, and I think a lot of that is being bred by social media because this stuff comes in on their phone or in their email and, and somebody looks at a picture and they wanna do that to their fire truck. And for a variety of reasons, especially in the Northeast where we have old firehouses that tend to have small doors, what they're seeing in the picture is doable. It's just not doable in their application. Good, good point. Uh, so Ed, in, from, uh, from your viewpoint, you know, ha having worked as a, as a firefighter and a fleet manager, and then uh, you know, now working in the industry, what issues do you see when the is to say the order comes over the transom and comes on your desk and now you get to work with the customer. Well, thank you all for having me too. 
<clears throat> um, I think that uh, probably one of the biggest things that has happened for me, and it has been COVID related, and which was the, the I think the part of your original question was uh, we're getting the orders in and uh, trying to process them, get them through the, the mid inspections and the final inspections, and then we're shipping the trucks out without anybody ever having actually come here and put their hands on the truck. So we've done uh, the virtual inspections, and um, it's one thing to show somebody their, their truck via camera, but there are some of the little details that end up being missing or um, you know, the angle just wasn't right and it looked like it was in the right spot and it wasn't. Um, I just think it has been really difficult from the COVID perspective and not being able to travel of really being able to have the customer put their hands on, on the truck and compare the written spec to the truck that exists out there in the showroom. Um, I think that's probably been my biggest challenge. And of course, having just come into the uh, business of selling trucks from being the, the guy who bought them, um, trying to empathize and think like the customer, while it appears to be easy, it really is a, pretty much a challenge. Good, very, very good point. And so, uh, <clears throat> Mike Wilbur, number one. Uh, <laughs> what uh, your your comments and, and thoughts on kind of wrap, wrapping this topic up, and then I had a couple of rapid fire things just want to throw out as a result of some really good points that John made at the outset. Right. Well, I, I certainly in agreement with John. Um, cu customers just aren't reading the spec. Uh, whether they can't be bothered, they don't have the time, they don't understand, um, but but they're just simply not reading the spec. And when you talk about buying through purchasing consortiums such as an HGAC or, or um, CoStar in the state of Pennsylvania or, or some others, it makes it extraordinarily easy to buy a truck rather than going to 180 page spec, but yet still, it doesn't even seem like they're reading that. And so uh, when we get to the point of coming to see Ed for a new truck, uh, everybody's shocked. Well, why? Well, because they didn't read anything that was attached to the truck and they just thought or they surmised or they guessed or I thought it was going to be like the other one or in Jeff's comment. Well, we had five of the other ones. So naturally, the sixth one's going to be the same. Well, no, not unless you tell them it's going to be the same. And I think everybody on this panel can agree if it's not in writing, it's not going to happen. And you're not as a customer going to get it. And, and that's the bottom line. So you need to be able to read and understand what you're reading so that at the end you are not disappointed and you're not getting in confrontations with uh, vendors and salesmen and everybody else basically because you just didn't read. Yeah, it's interesting. Just about everyone had, had the, uh, reiterated the comment that John brought out about, quote, not reading the spec. So many of the specs that I've encountered, a, a typical pumper spec now, well in excess of 120 pages, an aerial spec can push 200. Uh, this kind of rolls into a little bit in it with the pre-construction issues. Uh, John and Ed, let's go to you for both for a moment, comment on this. So when you get to the point of doing pre-construction, uh, do you have your customers go through the long verbiage, call it the text version of the spec, or are you typically referring to the stripper or the component list to lead them through? How does that work in your experience? I've, I've always liked the stripper and have the long spec beside it because it saves getting tired and falling asleep when they read paragraph by paragraph. But if it says it has 19 of this, then it's there. Then you know you're everybody's in agreement. And I agree, I call it the stripper, the line item description is the best way. Have the long spec if you want to get into one member of the committee wants to get, ask the minutia of it fine and dandy, but the line item allows it to go through quicker through the pre-con. And you've got to be prepared. And uh, to the point made by uh, Mike about these HGACs and CoStar and SourceWell, some of the people are going to that, which is a better way in some ways. Uh, I think it's a great way to expedite things because there is a time and cost for everyone. And But you got to make apples to apples. Ed? Yeah, I concur with John. And um, what I think, when I think of the stripper, I think of the stripper sheet as being sort of our response to what the, the customer specification or customer request was. So 
for, for us, the stripper is sort of a, a, a down and dirty, a shortened version of what we're providing that is relative to what the customer had asked for. So if we look at a stripper sheet and we need more uh, definition or more information, we can always go to that long spec. Um, so I think it helps in that regard. And then there are also the committee members or the group members that, um, that really wanna look at the truck on a cursory level and don't really care about all the detail. And then there's the, the folks that do. So it allows you to kind of jump back and forth and uh, sort of tailor that visit to the, the folks that are in the room with you. Good, thanks very much. So that, that kind of rolls us in that now we're, rigs on order, we're going to pre-construction. So we'll kind of go around the horn backwards here on this. So what issues do you find once you get the customer, whether it's virtually or hopefully here shortly, John, you'll open up there in the great white north, you can get back to doing doing business face to face across the enterprise. What kind of issues do you find at pre-construction? I guess a subset of that, uh, depending upon the size of your apparatus committee, what's a good workable number that you found that is going to guarantee more success than failures or questions when you get to the point of pre-construction? Uh, how what, what's a good number of people to get involved to make sure that people know what they're getting? but you, you don't end up having uh, looking like Thanksgiving dinner. Nobody's really sure what's on the menu and they can't come to agreement. So kind of go backwards, go, Jeff, uh, what's your experience on that? And uh, how's, what has worked well for you? Um, I find that, that six is about the maximum workable uh, number on, a, on an apparatus committee. Um, and that's, that's, basically is based on uh, observing it over the years. Um, we've, we've worked with apparatus committees that have been anywhere from one to 16. Um, I think you need a cross section of the department. I think you need a couple of senior guys and I think you need a couple of, of, of uh, you know, guys that have been around about, ha about half of an anticipated career and a couple of younger guys. I think that that cross section is important. Um, what I'm finding is the biggest problem with pre-cons right now is that neither the manufacturers or the committee really want to spend the time that, that is, is needed for a quality pre-con. Um, I'm starting to do a, a pre-pre-con with some of our customers where, where we sit down at the firehouse um, a couple of days before we even leave to go to the pre-con whether it's being held virtually at, at the dealerships conference room or whether it's it's at the factory um, so that we can iron out some of the things um, prior to even getting there. And, and that that seems to be helping. Good, good point. Re re really good idea there, uh, Jeff. Uh, Mike Wilbur, what's uh, what kind of issues you find in it that pre-construction uh, trying try to handle to uh, move things along? Well. Uh, I think to Jeff's point, the, the more people on a committee, the arduous it gets, uh, the more expensive it gets uh, because everybody wants their thing on the truck. Uh, so that runs the price of the truck up. Um, it, it ends up to be a lot more discussion and a lot more time. And for those uh, connected to the industry, we know that time is money. Um, and so it kind of runs full circle. Um, like Jeff, uh, we kind of subscribe to four to seven uh, on an apparatus committee with five being ideal, but certainly six is in there as well. Um, any more than seven and it just becomes arduous and, and um, it, it's kind of like trying to shovel water against the tide, so to speak, and it, it doesn't necessarily work very well to anybody's benefit. So I, I think that's, that's one thing as, as, as it relates to the committee. And I think like Jeff, there needs to be a mix, but I think if you have uh, an in-house mechanic, uh, I know from being on the FDNY uh, apparatus committee for a number of years, uh, we had two or three people from the shops uh, and they were just absolutely, um, absolutely needed in the process to determine what components were working over the previous um, set of trucks, what was not to switch components out um, and to figure out how we're going to move forward in, in the best fiscally prudent possible way and, and reduce downtime. So I think some kind of mechanic uh, needs to be on it. I think an officer needs to be on it. Um, and I think everybody in this process, especially when you get to pre-construction, 
you need to figure out who's going to drive the thing. Okay. Um, the years of snowy head people like John and Tom and, and Ed and I, for sure, uh, when we joined the fire service, it was not uncommon to have five or 10 CDL holders or people that drove tractors or had hydraulic experience. And that's just simply not the case today. And the bigger and heavier and longer and higher and faster that we build this stuff, um, the less in tune young people are to going to come down to the firehouse and, and drive it. So I think that group, even though they lack maybe experience, I think they need to have a say in the process because at the end of the day, many of us silver haired folks are going to be gone and they're going to end up with whatever's sitting out in the bay. And for them not to have a say, I think is very short sighted. Good, good points. Uh, Ed and John, uh, along the, the same lines of pre-construction, but we had a quick question to pop up. So two different perspectives from John selling and from Ed working, you know, now in the industry. When you get to the point of pre-construction, and if you have the stripper, as we discussed, the, you know, the short verbiage, we've got the 100 plus pages of specs, we've got a blueprint, uh, we might have a pump handle blueprint. If there becomes a conflict, between what the customer thought they were getting, but more importantly, between what the manufacturer presented in the proposal package, which takes precedence? The long verbiage spec, a, the short descriptive with the quote writer or whatever the software number is, or something that's shown on the blueprint. If the you know, customer is looking at that, for example, there's something that's indicated on the blueprint it is not described within the spec. From your from your, your perspectives, I'll start out with John. What what takes precedence, or how do you try to handle those issues? Well, that's a double-edged sword because I've seen some people. In fact, I've seen one manufacturer who put their spec prevails, not yours, not the city's. And I go, well, hold it. That doesn't make sense. You've really got to be careful. Uh, I think the long spec would prevail. I make it mandatory that my people read through it, that they know the truck as intimately as the customer and do uh, what Michael said earlier, have the mechanic involved. Too many trucks arrive and the mechanics never had any input. The shop has no input at all and avoid the change orders. And that relates to the specs. They get a $60,000 change order at the, at the uh, pre-con because, well, I thought it had this, I thought it had that. We just, we just, it's scary what's going on right now. So we need to be sure. We need to be prepared to smoke the bear so. Good point. John, Ed, your thoughts on that? Well, so wearing the buyer's hat, uh, I think that uh, that the, the points leading up to contract signing are very important. And that is whose document do you use and, um, and uh, what attachment is to it. So as an example, there is some type of, of formal contract that agrees that Company X is going to sell fire department, uh, the fire department a vehicle. To that, commonly is attached and is the attachment, which is the specifications. Those specifications that are in the contract language should be the specifications that prevail. But there's always intent, and what the intention of the specs meant, sometimes versus the actual words, uh, that's, I think, where that balancing act comes in when there is a discrepancy. But uh, I think that. I think that good, strong um, document preparation on the front side helps to, uh, at the very least, reduce, if not eliminate, that problem in its, in its entirety. And to add on to that, uh, if I could, that the onus on that falls in large part on the apparatus committee. The more work that they do up front, we're not talking about change orders and, and and any of these other things, the fact that they didn't do the work, they didn't read the spec, they didn't understand what they were getting, and to come to John's point and get $60,000 worth of change orders, that, that's absurd uh, in these tight budget times. So um, more work that's done up front on the part of the apparatus committee, and in some parts with, with Jeff and, and, and I, and, and Tom doing consulting work, our, our duty is to get all that work done up front so that when we sit at that pre-con, there aren't any change orders, there's no hard feelings, there's no misunderstandings, and everybody's pretty much singing from the same sheet of music. Yeah, but, uh, but you also have purchasing people that get, that get more involved in it, and that's fine. They have their responsibilities. 
but they want a, a Chevrolet, but they're really the fire department, the one with the budget wants a Cadillac. And then you get this, he said, she said, we've got to try and avoid that so that we're clear at the beginning, like Mike said, at the beginning of it, that you're, are we all on the same page? But I've seen countless situations where what somebody's asked for is not what they get. Or they get to the pre-con and say, well, you didn't ask for that. Oh, I thought we did what well, was on the last truck. That's then this is now. We have to be more careful of that. We're stewards of the taxpayer dollar, both as a dealer, an OEM, and the drawing is important. I've seen some drawings that are atrocious. I've seen very generic. We really need, I, if I were a customer and I was buying it, I would say, I want a drawing. If you could take the time to send me a hundred page document, you would take the time to do a proper drawing that has all the dimensions and the information on it. Not every little minutia of a light here and a light there, but have some layout that you understand what you think you're getting is what you are getting. Not, gee, that's not even close. Yeah. Very good point. Jeff, I was intrigued by you uh, commenting about pre-construction. It's, it's, it's becoming a larger issue uh, in, in looking at people that, again, to mention what, uh, reiterate what John said, they bought it through HGAC or some type of nationally recognized consortium, finding that fewer and fewer people are, are diving deep into the weeds uh, of exactly what, what they're getting. A recent experience I had, they relied upon their preferred vendor, put the project together. When we got to, you know, three o'clock on day one of the pre-construction, uh, we opened up Pandora's box when we get into warning lights. And then the gentleman that had several of the warning light catalogs memorized, all right, <laughs> is, says, uh, no, wait a second. That's not what we want. And several people look at one another who were senior members of the committee and said, well, what did we ask for in our spec? And then they had to come to the realization, well, you never wrote a spec. And the poor dealer got embarrassed because he said, well, I just, I put the basic 1901 compliant warning light system in. So now, you know, we're going to detail it to exactly what we want. And to go to John's point, when we get the change order, there was about 12 grand worth of things just on warning lights to get it tuned up to where they wanted because they were in such a rush to go buy the rig to get it on order, you know, to push it over the goal line. So, Jeff, what kinds of things do you coach up your folks when you do the pre-pre-construction to make sure that some of the things, like, for example, we just talked about, you know, where cab equipment is going to be uh, be mounted, uh, graphics, uh, you get into communications, whether it's MDT or radios, who's supplying them, where are they going? What kinds of things are you trying to work with your folks so when you get to pre-construction, you can spend the valuable time on things that really count and not, you know, jostling back and forth on the nickel and dime items? Well, first off, on, on consortium purchasing, I'm still at a loss to understand on, on vehicles as complex as fire apparatus has become, how even if you're opting to go through the consortium purchasing process, which I've certainly done with customers um, and, and several different consortiums, um, how you do that without a specification? That you're talking about a truck with tens of thousands of parts and pieces and there's just so much, so many options out there and, and different ways of departments doing things that you really need to have a, a, a document that tells the manufacturer or the, the dealership when they're preparing their consortium answer exactly what it is the fire department wants. Uh, I don't think a consortium purchase needs to be, have a specification that is as detailed as as going out to bid, but I think it certainly needs to have um, have some detail. Uh, it, it's just, uh, I think that eliminates a lot of problems right from the get go. Um, I try to, uh, when it comes to, when it comes to mounting things or placing things, <clears throat> I'm finding that, um, and, and this goes back to a point that Mike made, when, when I got on the fire department a million years ago, almost everybody in my department was a tradesman of one sort or another. And the tradesmen understand the process. You don't have to be a truck mechanic. You could be an, a, a plumber or a HVAC guy. But if you're a tradesman, you understand the process and the process limitations. And that was tremendously valuable on apparatus committees. And that's, 
that's in large part gone. So there's a lot of explaining to do. Um, a lot of departments don't know what they want as far as, as where they're going to put stuff. Um, some don't want to make that decision until they see sit in the cab. So what I try to do in, in cases like that is, um, is say that is to list the equipment that will be mounted and put it as to be, pre, to be determined at mid-process inspection or to be determined at final inspection. That way it gets costed into the vehicle. So dollar-wise, there's no surprises. And that, that, um, that also helps move the pre-construction process along because you're not spending an hour deciding if the uh, uh, terminal should be on the doghouse or, or in front of the officer. Yeah, even send photos along to at a pre-con. I mean, we're doing things virtually. And honestly, I don't think from the Canadian perspective, I don't see us going back because if you've got to take, say, I, I have not seen more than four people at a pre-con, a Canadian pre-con down at Smeal or what have you, or SVI, five at the maximum. But, you know, the airfare, the hotels, the meals, the car rental, that's a cost that has to be absorbed. And I have one salesman, 50 trucks. He was 50 times at the factory. So there's almost the whole year gone. So the virtual, whatever we're calling it now, is really going to help us. I think we'll see more virtual or real time showing the truck to the fire department. Touchy feely, here's a demo truck. Have a look at the layout. Okay, well, let's put our MDT here and send those pictures with a piece of tape. I think they're going to help a lot in the future, where before you'd have them for three days and they still couldn't make their mind up where the stripe was going to go on the door. No, that's a, it's, it's a great, great comment, John. They said, if you just think about the way most fire truck specifications are laid out, no matter what manufacturer it is, What's typically always in the last couple of pages is the detail of painting, graphics, and then the loose equipment. And for folks that aren't accustomed to sitting down, you know, for an eight hour day and intensely going through the stripper to get to those meaty issues where everyone has an opinion, it, it, it tends to really drag the process down. So, and you commented about, you know, uh, people doing the virtual inspections uh, and then you know, m missing simple things like not being able, for example, climb up the back of the vehicle and realize, yeah, everything's NFPA compliant, but boy, we should have put one handrail here. So when folks come in the pre-construction, uh, there's, I've noted recently, probably because of doing more things virtually, two manufacturers have gone to sending out like an informational package prior to the virtual pre-construction. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the things you need to have addressed or, 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 or uh, answers to, uh, what have you folks done uh, to try to help uh, your company through that part of the process to keep the production lines rolling? Well, you hit the nail on the head, more information out farther in advance. And uh, there's always a, you know, there's particularly with the, in the virtual environment, there is much more banter back and forth with when you said you wanted to mount this this way, did you mean like this or like this? And mocked up versions sent back and forth to better gain understanding. Um, I wanted to build on something that Mike said uh, just uh, maybe 10 minutes ago, though, with regard to the, uh, the clarification process, too. And uh, I've experienced um, asking the customer, well, what did you mean in this verbiage? And uh, they oftentimes will say, well, I don't know. We copied that from from the vendor that su supplying that particular component to the truck. So I don't really know what my intention was. I just know I want, wanted one of these. And, uh, but one of those may come in, in a variety of, of models. So um, that's been the challenge and uh, trying to move information back and forth to better gain that clarity has really been the big goal here. And uh, certainly with, with my customers who tend to be the bigger, bigger uh, fleet groups in the government. No, no, good point. I like it. It's interesting. It's uh, <clears throat> the, the thought process of more information up front uh, and whether it's uh, like John's comment about going back and, you know, marking up a blueprint, providing pictures, things. If this is, if this is what I want, I think you're spot on at a lot, a lot of folks, 
you can read the half paragraph and then ask anybody on the four member committee, what, you know, what did you really want there? And you just see people look, you know, staring across the table. Ah, oh, we're not, not really, not really sure there. We but have, especially, we, especially too, you're getting these EMS compartments and all this equipment going in the cab. And it's like deer in the headlights. Well, where do we put it? And, and I, I hate seeing fire departments but two shelves or three shelves in every compartment and then they throw them out because they're useless because that's not what they thought of so we do a pre pre-con where we sit down with the customer and we talk about things it's so helpful but because then when you do the actual pre-con we at virtual or at the factory you pretty much got the nailed down and dialed into what you want and it saves money in the long term yeah, we had, had a question come in from the audience about within a large fleet, isn't there some degree of, you know, fleet standardization? Uh, so we'll throw that out to, to Michael, right? In, in FDNY, you know, you operated in a couple of different ladder companies. When you were uh, across the other side of the Bronx, was there a big difference from one vehicle to the other? I'm assuming in an operation like that, there's a fair amount of standardization and not a lot of individualization. Uh, amongst the different types of rigs. Yeah, that's correct. Each uh, company had to um, have a certain amount of equipment and they had to have it in, in certain places. You could uh, finesse it a little bit, but overall, whether you went to Brooklyn or Queens and you were on a rear mounted ladder, it had a hearse tool, it had airbags, it had a couple of saws that were in the back compartment. The stuff was pretty much in the same place. Um, when we started getting into, they were called SAVE units, safe uh, accident uh, vehicle extrication units. Um, all the trucks were laid out. Um, they had an airbag uh, compartment where the airbags uh, could be stored and they had a, 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 a jaws of life type compartment on it. And they were all in the same places. Um, they varied between towers and aerials only because the compartmentation varied, but um, if you went to a tower, um, all, all that equipment was in the same place, whether you were in Staten Island or you were in Manhattan. And the engine companies were pretty much the same as well, um, except when you got into the high pressure pumping engines in Midtown Manhattan that had a third stage pump. Uh, they had specialized equipment and specialized hose uh, for those high pressures that were just unique to those units. But uh, pretty much the standard engine bed was um, uh, some three and a half on the left, some two and a half on the right, and two and a half an inch and three quarter on the two middle beds, and all the lines were hand stretched at that uh, point in time, and that was pretty much a hose load for a New York City engine. So um, it, it was it was pretty standard. But to the question as well, um, when you're talking about individual volunteer departments, where we've done a lot of work where a small city has seven individual volunteer companies and they almost to a point don't want to be like the other guy uh, to get standardization is pretty difficult, if not politically impossible. Yep. John, with some of your larger uh, customers up in Canada, say from a fleet standardization standpoint, if one of the larger cities where you've do done work, do you find the smaller communities that kind of leverage off that that larger department's experience and say, hey, I'm be, being a little bit too simplistic here, but get me one of those and we'll paint it our color and put some different warning lights and graphics on it. But if it works in that big city and works for them, uh, maybe that's that's a good choice uh, to make sure that the rig's bulletproof and has the right components on it because they've already done the research for it. Somewhat, but it's like anything. It's like Chevrolet, Ford, and GM, a guy says, I want a Chev, I want a Ford, I want a GM. Well, you don't go tell them you want to have it peculiar to what your needs are. Um, you take Calgary, they've got 48 of, of the certain pumper. A city as big as them has a side mount pumper. They have a top mount and closed pumper. Uh, I don't think the smaller cities, I think any city wants to be right for their community for what they need. I don't see a, well, I'll take one of, I'll take a Vancouver, just give me a Vancouver and I'll stripe it. I don't see that happening because every city's got uniqueness. And I think we as salesmen need to listen and don't sell. What do you want it to do? We'll tell you what's out there, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and you make an informed decision. Too many people want to buy cookie cutters. Then they go, but that's not really what I wanted after they get it. Well, 
20 years later, you're stuck with it. Or for 20 years, you're stuck with it. So I don't, I see every city being unique, uh, staffing, risks, flows, et cetera. No, th thanks, John. I think it was uh, Mike Wilbur at one, one, one point mentioned to a customer as they were describing, you know, their, their soon to be purchased or specified road rocket, you know, started out and said to stop, what's the mission of the vehicle? Uh, so to go to that, that point, uh, Jeff, you mentioned about, uh, you know, departments not writing a specification. And I guess back in the old days, you know, when, when people would put pen to paper or when I started, you'd put uh, two pieces of paper and a carbon sheet of carbon paper in there and start banging it out and hope like heck you didn't hit the wrong key. Uh, you know, the difference between writing a, a, a performance spec uh, where you're, you're, you're not detailing uh, everything on the vehicle and leaving some of that intuitively for the bidder to, to supply and then for you evaluate ver versus something where you utilize your, as I call it, preferred vendor spec or something in between. So what do you see that's uh, the challenges with working with each or where in, in your area from your experience, what's going on, where, where's the marketplace going to that? Wow, where the marketplace is going? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I, th I I'm surprised at where the marketplace has been um, for the last couple of years. Um, I the the amount of money that departments seem to be spending on on fire apparatus, um, where every time you you go to a bid opening or get a reply from a, a consortium um, purchase, and you look at the bottom line. And you ask yourself where it's going to stop. It, it doesn't seem to be. And departments seem to be um, spending a lot of money, um, which I, I came from a, I, you know, I, I came from a very fiscally conservative municipality. Um, and I had to, I, I had to justify things very carefully if I expected to, to get it. Um, and it, it kind of surprises me that, that, we're not seeing some kind of back off on, on some of the stuff that, that people are, are doing with their fire apparatus. The interesting perspective. Uh, Ed, what, what do you see at, at your end? Again, Jeff and where Mike and I originally hailed from in different areas of, of New York, it's a Jeff's spot on. Uh, there were different price points you know, in U.S. dollars, I, I I candidly thought when when it when this quote somewhat standard engine, you know, got to be more than six or six and a quarter, that be they said there's a got to be a time out here. We we have to reprioritize and re, refocus. Uh, recently had a fire chief contact me that said he was having issues with his to go to John's point problems with his finance folks looking at the cost of these. Uh, the, the new apparatus that said in, in that case, because they had a pretty aggressive 12 year replacement program, uh, that it, the, the increase in cost of apparatus had outpaced the part for this very, very large, very affluent county to be able to fund. They weren't gonna be getting the requisite six engines, three trucks and a heavy squad each year. The guy came back and said, here's the pot of money, like pushing it across the table. Uh, you figure out what you want, uh, but you know, which we, we, we can't afford that, you know, th those numbers anymore. So what do you see happening, you know, and you're from a national perspective of folks of how they're handling that? Well, I, I can just uh, to, to go backward just a little bit, you know, from my perspective, when I was a buyer, um, ad city administrators are, are, are uh, very much better educated now, and they have access to a lot better information nowadays. Uh, organizations like ICMA, which is the uh, a municipal uh, storehouse of data um, allows folks like your finance uh, people and your city administrators to, to find comparable cities. And they use those comparable cities to do things like staffing surveys and to determine compensation for employees and figure out what a, uh, uh, a logical or a normal number for uh, workmen's compensation claims are. They do all that. And they're starting to do the same thing with, with fire apparatus purchases and, and uh, police equipment and all that type of things. So if they have a, an, a sister city that they can bounce their ideas off of, 
when the fire chief comes to them with this, the $600,000 question that you just asked, uh, they have some ammunition now to uh, refute that and come back and say, no, you're, we have more of a $450,000 problem. So I think that's the one thing. But nationally, um, organizations are struggling to get the money and they're using more and more of their data to help validate why they do need to continue buying that premium fire engine. Sometimes that data is wonderful and sometimes not so much. As you know, I work in data all the time with fire departments for accreditation. So I, I think it behooves anybody that wants to buy a fire engine to be out there and really know the mission of the apparatus, the usage, its true life expectancy, and, um, and when it's, its useful life is going to end so they can better predict it. That was kind of a mouthful and I apologize. But that was a pretty big question that you asked. And those were the, the thoughts that came to mind as you were, you were asking them. No, very good. You, 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 you kind of hit on the, on, the, on the life cycle costing, which there's very few departments that uh, I've happened to encounter that when you, you get to the right person in fleet or wherever, in some cases, it's somebody, as you mentioned, it's an analyst that's outside you know, the enterprise of the fire department. He's not, he's not a uniformed ranking uh, person. That, that, I, that crunches, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I didn't mean to uh, steal your thunder. I think there's two important questions to ask when you talk about life cycle of a fire engine. And uh, it, it's oftentimes described as its useful life. But uh, how long before you wear the truck out nowadays? And it, it's just not a reliable fire engine because you've worn the componentry out. And with technology now, how, what's its useful life relative to the technology on it? Can I get parts to replace the, the electronic components. And uh, so I think those are two, um, two different ideas that are starting to collide together and really determining what true life cycle is. So there are, there are small volunteer fire departments up in your neighborhood that have one beautiful trucks with virtually no mileage on, which can't buy parts for. Them. And then there are 10 year old trucks that you can buy parts for, but they're worn out uh, like Michael's FDNY. Yeah, no, no, both very good points. John. I think one of the issues, remember Bruna Senior, a good old friend, used to say delivering pizza in a concrete truck. We also have to look at the, the chief officers or the mechanical apparatus people. They don't get as much input in some departments as they should. And sometimes they get a good uh, blend of what do you need it to do? Let me spec it out. I wish we'd see more of that. And, uh, you know, it's, I've been doing this 40 plus years, so I majored myself, but you know, I don't tell my painter how to paint the house. He, he doesn't tell me how to build a fire truck or sell a fire truck, you know, the components. I think if you wanna deal with brand X, you deal with brand X. If you wanna deal with brand Y, you deal with brand Y. Don't waste people's time doing a bid, going through all the specs and the, you know, the, the optics of it because purchasing gets their fingers in it. We're seeing more and more purchasing getting involved and they create a spec, maybe 20 pages of technical and hundred pages of boilerplate. It is ludicrous. We need to try and have the two sides work together. You know, the purchaser, uh, we're, we're finding, we're seeing HGAC's derivative uh, source well, uh, now an RMA, which is an Alberta Rural Municipality Association working together. We've got some cities that have gone into it and bought off it to, to speed up the process. And it's like, it's not rocket science, it's simple, but it takes some time to do. But I think HGAC, I think if I'm correct, high 80s, 90% of trucks in Texas and California don't, don't even go to bid. They're bought through cooperative purchasing. Maybe we've got to look at that more and more to make more um, 21st century decision-making. It's like technology. Remember the old vernier throttle? And then we went to a pressure governor. Oh my God, the sky is going to fall. It didn't. Now we're into electronics. It's here to stay. Can't buy a car without it. No, really good points, John. But uh, if they bring back the vernier throttle and a relief valve and they make it cheaper than the, uh, the governor, you got a buyer here. I'd, <laughs> I'd, 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 go, I'd go into that. Uh, so we want to roll into the last topic here. We got about 10 minutes to, to, to go. Is it fire department responsibilities with respect to uh, packaging the unit to make sure that uh, we don't have 
a, an overweight unit or something that might approach to be being overweight either upon delivery or once they get it all upfitted uh, with, with their uh, personnel and, and equipment. So uh, Mike Wilbur, thoughts, thoughts on that? What, uh, what works and what doesn't work? Well, we know from the work that you and I do, Tom, that over a third of the trucks that we evaluate as far as fleet evaluations each year uh, are overweight. Uh, and they're not all old. Uh, some of them are fairly new. Um, there's, I think, a great deal of confusion. And it's funny, this discussion's gone full circle about reading what you're getting and about understanding what you're getting. Because if you are not engaged as a customer, and if the salesman is not engaged, uh, and you are buying a, a ladder, regardless of what kind from whoever, the loose equipment default is 2,500 pounds. That doesn't mean that the vehicle can't be axled to carry greater than 2,500 pounds. In fact, you did one for Winchester, uh, Virginia, that was capable of carrying 4,000 pounds of loose equipment because that's what the customer uh, desired. But if nobody says anything at the table, uh, we just I just did an aerial needs assessment for a department in upstate New York. Uh, we weighed their truck, it was overweight, uh, 19 year old rear mounted, uh, tower with no pump, no tank, was overweight on the front axle. So then we said, okay, well, you got to take the equipment off of it now and weigh it again to see how much loose equipment. Well, they had never been taught or told about any of this. They had 2,800 pounds of loose equipment on the truck. So if they had told the salesman like John Witt to say, hey, play that one again, we're going to do the same thing, uh, they would have had a truck that was overweight. Um, so customers need to be engaged with this. They need to understand what the standard says. Um, engines with less than 250 cubic uh, feet of compartment space or 200, uh, 2,000 pounds, uh, water tenders, tankers, or 1,000 pounds of loose equipment. And you need to go to the standard and find out what loose equipment is. Uh, hose is not loose equipment. Portable ladders is not loose equipment. So you need to have a full understanding. And then everybody... Uh, should be weighing their trucks according to the 1911 standard annually uh, to keep up with it and make sure people aren't putting stuff on the trucks. And, and it's well-meaning. I mean, you have the captain sitting out in the apparatus bay and he's looking up at the engine and looking at the hose bed and wow, there's a lot of room. And then he's looking over at the five inch hose that's sitting there on the floor. Well, if a thousand feet's great, 1500 feet's gotta be better. So let's put that on there. Well, well the truck wasn't designed for that load and you're gonna throw it into an overweight condition. Um, and, and overweight trucks, uh, as long as you got money for brakes and springs and tires, it doesn't matter until you hit somebody and then yep. it's gonna really matter. And uh, contrary to the um, all the wives tales of you're exempt because you're a fire truck, uh, not so much, no. Yeah, good points. Jeff, what do, do you incorporate in when you're uh, writing a spec for a department uh, to validate the the weight carrying cap capabilities of the rigs and when you go to final any any uh, suggestions for the uh, for the audience as to what they can do to validate that or try to confirm that as, as best as they can uh, before the rig heads out to head home the first thing i do it was when, very early on in this in the in the process with the fire department i, I tell the guys on the apparatus committee to to stop by the firehouse when it's quiet not not meeting night, not not after a call, but and, and bring a notepad with them and walk around the truck and take a look at the equipment that they're carrying on the existing truck. Because I define a fire truck like getting old. Every year you put on a few pounds. Um, we're real good about putting stuff on fire trucks. We're real bad about taking stuff off of fire trucks. And that's everywhere you go. So make some hard decisions on your equipment. What are you carrying that's useful? What's on that truck that you haven't taken off that truck except to clean in the last five years? Do you really need to carry this stuff? And let's see if we can whittle down your equipment list. And then we look at what's on their equipment wish list, the things they want to buy in the next few years. I also try to figure out um, about a 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, leeway um, for them for future growth because you know they're going to buy more equipment and they're going to put it on the truck so you 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 want to have 
and it's a bit of a balancing act because it's very easy to overspec the axles, but then they have a horrible ride quality and handling uh, capabilities. So you're you're trying to balance real world considerations with with operational considerations and and future leaving them a path so that when they do buy some new equipment over the next five years, they don't put themselves in an overweight situation. And, and Mike's point is absolutely right. You, you really have to have departments have to get into the idea that they need to weigh their trucks annually and, and be accountable to that because um, it is, it, not only is it in the NFPA, but practical application tells you um, there's gonna be a lot, a lot more wear and tear on your truck if you're running it overweight than there is if you're running it the way you should. Hey, Tom, what do you mean you don't Tom, need to treat door opener Tom, anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Look, we got about four more minutes. So if you want to make some final questions and comments here, and John, sorry, I interrupted your comment there, but okay. we got All right. Minutes. So let's, uh, we'll, 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 we'll go around, a, around the horn here, starting with John, uh, wrap up most important things you think that the customer could do to make their life a little bit easier and simpler and ensure success when it comes to delivery day and the rig shows up on the ramp. Deal with the, vendor, dealer that you want to work with that has the facilities and resources to support after the sale. Too many people want to buy a vehicle from X because it looked good, but then what about, is that guy going to be around to take care of you after the fact? So look at the long term that what you buy is going to last for the community for the time period of 15, 20 years, 10 years, but have, have somebody with after sale service support. Uh, Ask the questions. A question not asked is, is one not answered. You've got to ask the questions about weight, um, axles, componentry, what's the trends. We want to be a resource for you. That's what we should be doing. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, John. Ed, final thoughts. Uh, I would say do your homework on the front end. Know what you need. Articulate it well in your bid document. Use that bid document to create a, an instrument to measure the responses from, from your, uh, the other manufacturers or from the manufacturers. And uh, use that as the tool then that if that instrument is good up to that point, then you can use it through contract signing, bid inspection, final inspection, and even follow up on, on the, life, the life of the vehicle as a whole. But do your homework up front. If you're going to use a manufacturer specification, word for word, Make sure that word for word, it's what you want. And if not, create your own document. Good. Ed, thank you very much. A lot of, lot of uh, on point uh, comments. Thank Mike you. Wilbur. Uh, way before you pay. Um, uh, load it up. And one of the last things you do before you cut a check for that apparatus is make sure that it makes weight. And if it doesn't, as a customer, you have every right to refuse the truck. Uh, as long as you came up with a tool and equipment list and you told the manufacturer exactly how much equipment you had, uh, they needed to build the truck uh, for that. And also I'm a firm believer, even with all the videos and uh, Zoom and everything, you need to go to the factory for the pre-con. I, I think that really uh, cuts out a lot of misunderstandings. And, and I, I know it's expensive and I know it's time consuming, but uh, to my point, uh, and maybe I'm just old fashioned, but I think that that's time and money well invested to get people boots on the ground in the factory um, to figure out what you're doing. All right. Thanks, Mike. Jeff. I'll, um, I'll reiterate Mike's comment about going to the factory. I think that is a very important part of the process. Um, and I think that you have to come into this understanding as an apparatus committee member that this is a very detailed, sometimes mind-numbingly boring detailed process. And it is very, very important that you, you track those details and pay attention to those details because those are what will make the process successful or, or a failure. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists, John Witt, Ed Boring, Mike Wilber, Jeff Gaskin, great information. Appreciate all your uh, guidance and experience for the audience this afternoon.